Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Dr. Leslie Mitchell, who is a pioneer in synthetic biology and genome engineering. She has a PhD in systems biology from the University of Ottawa and a postdoc uh, across both Johns Hopkins and NYU, where she was involved in a pretty groundbreaking project involving creation of a synthetic yeast using genome engineering. Uh, and today, Leslie is the CEO and co-founder of Neochromosome, which is a biotech startup that's really taking, I think, a pretty fascinating approach to deliver entire chromosomes designed and built de novo into host cells. And we're going to learn a lot more about this. This is one of our first episodes, I think probably the first episode, going deep into the world of genome engineering and yeast and model organisms. We've done a little model organisms in the past, but not a deep dive like this. So I'm super excited for it. And Leslie, thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time. Happy to be here. I'd love to just uh, hear about how you got interested in this field to begin with. What was your first exposure to synthetic biology and genome engineering? And then maybe you could walk through a little bit of your research career in the in both Ottawa and JHU and NYU that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do that. I think it's sort of all wrapped up into one one story. And that is to say, I was wrapping up my PhD in Ottawa. It was yeast genetics related work. I had to invite an external examiner to be part of my thesis defense. And so I reached out on a whim to Jeff Buka, who is sort of a world-renowned geneticist. He was at Hopkins at the time and asked him to join my thesis committee. And he did. And so he he showed up and gave a seminar the day before my defense. And I learned about this concept of rather than studying genetics and biology by breaking things, which is to say, change a gene and see what happens, building from scratch. And the concept of the meta question being, do we know enough about biology, genetics, et cetera, to des design whole genomes from scratch and sort of test and extend our knowledge around, around biology by building de novo entire genomes. And so this, this to me was like mind blowing. And I thought, this is something I could get into, all the caveats of breaking things and seeing what happens. Does the antibody have specificity, blah, 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 all of those questions that felt like this was like this totally new approach. And so luckily I gave a pretty good thesis defense. And over the course of that day, Jeff's flight was canceled and he spent the day. So we spent a bunch of time together. And by the end of the day, I had an invite to join his lab. And so that was exciting. And certainly career altering, I had not planned to do a postdoc. And so that is how I got off on, on onto this sort of synthetic genomes career track. Amazing. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you accomplished during that postdoc, some of the big, big projects. Sure. And the field underwent some amazing transformation during that time. I remember I was a, a PhD student at the time, not at all involved in constructing artificial genomes, but watching some of the papers coming out and being amazed actually at, you know, to the point you made earlier, what became possible in that period of time. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Yeah. The, the, the first synthetic cell from, from the Venture Institute, I think was in 2010. And so this sort of just preceded my completion of the PhD and sort of joining Jeff's lab, but the big project in Jeff's lab a little distinct from the original synthetic cell in the Venture Institute was not to rewrite a whole genome from scratch. And by rewrite, I mean, take the, take the sequence that's known in databases and just remake that basically same sequence, but just do it synthetically. The, the concept for what is now known as the Synthetic Yeast Genome Project, or SC 2.0, was to take the wild type sequence and in silico make designer changes across the length of that genome. Yeast has a 12 million base pair genome length, 16 linear chromosomes genes, centromeres, telomeres, repeats, the whole, the whole nine that everyone's you know, used to when thinking about genomes, but make changes across the genome as part of the design that would allow us to open up new, otherwise unapproachable questions with respect to the downstream biology we could study. Examples, let's delete all the repeats. Are they really necessary for a genome to function? That's a simple one. tRNAs, which are a source of genome instability, Let's move those all into one place and take them out of the out of the, the the chromosome positions. Does the cell function? Is the genome more stable? Remove introns. If you remove introns, can then you remove the spliceosome, which is otherwise essential? Are there other essential functions of the spliceosome? All these questions related to how could you ever answer them unless you designed the genome from scratch and eliminated or modified all those features? The final change that's kind of groundbreaking is the ability to, with a chemical switch, change the entire genomic architecture of the design and sort of synthetic organism. And that is to say, the world's greatest acronym, SCRAMBLE. Let me see if I can get it right. Synthetic chromosome recombination 
and modification by lots of mediated evolution. Nice. I haven't said that one in a while, but putting a peppering the genome with LOXP sites to enable chemically induced recombination globally. Obviously, a lot of cells will die. The deletion of an essential gene would, would cause death, but every cell that survives, you're going to have essentially in parallel millions of new genomes to search for interesting phenomes, phenotypes, excuse me. And so the scramble system was, I think, probably one of the features that put everyone over the top. Back in, I think this was like 2007. What do you need to do to justify writing 12 million base pairs of, of, of genome? Back then, that was going to be like a dollar or two dollars a base pair or something like that. Wow. And so, you know, it's a big decision to make. Yes. How do we even get to the end of this project? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're blowing my mind with some of these fundamental questions. I'd love to actually take some of those in order and, and just know <laughs> what the answers were. Because my I, I come from the rare disease and non-coding genome world. And I, I was also uh, in humans wrestling with the question of what is what is all of this genome doing here? And is it important? And what happens if you delete big chunks right. of it? And you only see that in humans in rare disease cases or in population genomics programs. But to the point you made earlier, it's subtraction rather than addition, and you don't have the toolkit. So for some of those questions, what, what did you learn? Well, uh, we're getting much, much closer to the answer. And I think there's a lot of a lot to unpack here. I will say some key points to make here. There's been two major milestones associated with this SC2 project. And of course, in the academic world, that tracks back to publications. Well, I should say three. The initial publication, which was sort of 2011, there was a batch of papers released in science in 2017 describing many of these features, how to build chromosomes, how to consolidate them, that they all seem to work and are stable and then use of the scramble system. And then just about two weeks ago, there was another big batch of papers released in Cell. So at this point in time, the status of the project, 100% of the designed DNA is in cells. That is to say, each there's 16 strains in the world, each of which carries one synthetic chromosome. Wow. There's a series of strains with increasingly more synthetic chromosomes consolidated. And all of this has been described now. So we're at about 50% consolidated into one cell. So we don't necessarily have the answer to all of these questions yet, which is to say, we don't know about the introns. We don't know about the repeats. All signs point towards no major functional consequence to deleting all of those elements in the context of individual chromosomes or most you know, the most we can say is up to 50% of the cell. So it's kind of a remarkable thing. And I think there's so many learnings from this project on the technology side. How do you design, build, deliver, evaluate function, debug design features that you didn't really anticipate causing fitness defects, but certainly how long it takes to get to the answer. And, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about Neo as we go forward, but our, one of our goals is, is to start to figure out how to do these sort of things, these start types of projects a lot more efficiently. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly where I was going to go with it. What did you learn about how to how to build chromosomes during that that seven or eight years of your life that you spent here? Yeah. And, and, and yeah. how do we take it going forwards? What how what does it take? What does it cost? How long does it take today? And then what is what does the future look like? Yeah, when you kind of look at SC2, the 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 project is probably going to be about 15 years end to end ish, 50 or 60 like core scientists plus an enormous number of additional supporting cast members including a lot of undergrads who participated in this project over the years. I will note they all show up as authors on these papers, which is very the exciting right for them. Do. Yep. Yes. And millions and millions of dollars how this all got funded is a separate conversation. But how do you go forward and instead of 15 years, do this in a year or a day? You know, we're definitely not at a day yet, but I think we have line of sight on a year for 12 million base pairs. I think that's really, really the realistic number. State of the art is still order synthetic DNA in small pieces. And how quickly can you assemble it and, excuse me, into large pieces and then install that DNA into the, the destination cell? And are you going to install it as an add-on and then sort of eliminate the original? Or are you going to just do like a swap and, and replace right up front and then sort of do that iteratively depending on, on the cell type and the sort of length of DNA you can deliver in a single in a single shot? And so there's enormous amount to unpack across all of that. But in short, hierarchically is your answer, the TLDR on that. 
Yeah, so maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about the inspiration behind Neochromosome, why you decided to start a company and move out of academia. And then I'd like to get into the mechanics of actually how these things are built. Are they printed? Sure. Are they synthesized? Sure, sure. But first, I'd love to hear about how you, how you decided sure. to start a company. Sure. Well, my ne my my life goal was never to be an academic, and I appreciate a lot of things going in a, on in academia, and there's also things that I, I struggle with. So um, I had always wanted to um, go into industry. That That's number one. Um, number two, we had this sort of big technology stack, at least in principle, um, which is to say, how do you think about a lot of experience, let's say, thinking about designing whole genomes, the yeast genome in particular. As an aside, I stopped working on ST2 probably around 2017 and turned a lot of my attention to taking this technology and putting it into mammalian cells at the 100 or 150 KB length range. And so how do you design sort of generically large pieces of DNA for many different organisms? How do you build it really, really quickly? And quickly is still on the order of weeks or months. How do you deliver it? And that's now cell type specific. And then what validation steps do you need? Sequencing for sure, but phenotyping. The concept of that technology stack did not exist outside of academia. And so as, as a scientist would do, Jeff, Joel Bader, who is another uh, core member of the, of the SC2 sort of leadership, which is to say he was, he, was the, he was the lab that worked on the design concepts and a lot of the validation at the sequencing level. Jeff, Joel, and I kind of got together in a hypothesis-driven fashion, said, hey, let's, you know, let's point this outward and see if there's any yes. customers. And so incorporated the company, and then it sort of just sort of sat idle for a few years while we, I talked to people and, and, and essentially, you know, there was two paths, one get venture funding or two find someone to pay us to do something right out of the gates. And so yep. it turned out to be this, the second option. Uh, and we found a, a chemical sort of a top 10 chemical company that was interested in a larger scale yeast-based engineering project. And so with, with a small amount of money and, and as luck would have it, the opening of Launch Labs in New York City, which was in the same building that the Buka Lab happened to be located in at the time. We had money, we had a space, and we had a, a company. And so Neo was sort of born into the physical world, July 1st, 2017. And I remember that because that's Canada Day and I'm Canadian. But anyway, that's what got us off the ground. And from there, it was a, 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 you know, a lot of inbound associated with Jeff giving talks around the world uh, yeah. and, and folks sort of coming out of the woodwork and, and additional projects, as well as SBIR funding, which was tremendously valuable to help fund NEO over those first couple of years. Amazing. That's how we got going. I wanted to ask about, there must have been a transition for you at some point of, it sounded like at the beginning, you were fascinated by the basic science of all of this, right? How do we understand the genome? Or, or biology in a fundamental level and how it works. But at some point, you start to transition into applications. What are some of the big applications of this? And was there a gradual or a sudden transition where you thought, actually, there's a million and one industrial applications of this core scientific yeah. idea that I want to take forward? Sure. Well, one thing I'll say, I, I don't actually think I'm a discovery-driven scientist at all. I'm a process-driven scientist. I love thinking about how to do things more efficiently with fewer reps or more robustly. Yep. They work every time, blah, blah, blah. And that's actually 100% how we think about hiring at NEO because what we do ultimately isn't, I wouldn't say it's repetitive. There's a lot of discovery to be made and how to do things efficiently. And that's kind of what motivates me. But we have to automate and run processes at very high throughput to enable the sort of genome level engineering approaches. What are the applications, which is a wonderful question. At a high level, I think most of the applications have yet to be identified. We have two great ideas we're working on internally. And the way, and I'll talk about those in a second. And the way we're thinking about identifying the whole world of, you know, to be identified opportunities uh, at NEO is really to build an ecosystem of like-minded genome scale thinkers that does not exist today. This is almost a new category on some level. Yes. It, it kind of depends. Like a whole genome is a lot. If you sort of say, we're going to start the definition of a whole genome at multi-gene pathways, it's much more accessible. But 
That said, in both of those cases, I think the majority of biotech is at like the base pair gene level change, SimBio yeah. being a subcategory. That said, the idea of building an ecosystem is sort of engaging companies across biotech, identifying, that's all sectors, but identifying the immediate near-term needs of those companies and projects that we can work on today. And those are often very bite-sized, but they're valuable because it allows us to develop trust with those new partners and engage in very deep discovery conversations about what it is that's truly challenging to them and you know explain the technology explain the sort of new way of thinking about cell engineering in their domain area and then sort of go back and forth and identify what those future states could look like for application areas and cell types and domains that I know nothing about yeah and so that's been exciting and 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 all of that is sort of wrapped up into what are the things we can do for you now that leverage our automation and our systematic approach to doing science onboarding workflows optimizing them operating them tech transferring them back what are we doing internally and that's sort of like the second half of the strategy of neo right now and that's sort of leading the charge and and showing the being exemplary about what the technology can do by building a couple of high value platform strains. One is one is probably going to be directed towards gene and cell therapy applications. And the other one with respect to new to nature protein biomanufacturing. So we call those Neo Vector and Neo Yeast. Good naming. You have actually well, put Neo in front of everything now. Yes, that's right. You got to do it. I'd love to hear about both of those in turn. So what, because uh, I, I was going to ask about mammalian delivery and sure. presumably there's a path towards human delivery there. Maybe yep. you could talk a little bit about the gene therapy applications. Sure, that you sure, sure. See. Yep. Yeah, that's the, I think the number one challenge when talking about engineering mammalian cells is delivery. How do you get longer pieces of DNA into cells efficiently. And, and of course, it's not like it's one cell type or each organ or each species has one cell type. It's many, many, many cell types, and they all have their own unique challenges associated with response to, to foreign DNA being, being stuck into them. So the NeoVector platform is a viral-based delivery platform for high-efficiency delivery of up to 150 KB DNAs which is a lot of payload relative to what is sort of state of the art now. If you say Lenti is like top of the line, if you will, you're 15Xing that, I guess, or so. So that strain is in development and it's, it's a, I think in 2024, we'll be facing sort of a, a proof of concept complete if things are going well over the next month or two. And we'll have some exciting decisions to make around how we want to carry that forward. I'm thinking about what, can't you deliver with a 10 KB or so Lenti that you yeah. would want to deliver with 150 KB? Are we talking about, you know, tens of genes in a pathway and you can start booting a cell up with a whole new pathway? What what can you deliver that's in that 10 to 150 KB that you couldn't with a Lenti? I think it's pathways. And I, I think more importantly, it's more natural looking genes with right. natural regulation and 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 including introns. Yeah. So like something like 90% of human genes are in the length scale of about 100K, KB, I should say. Right. And so from that point of view, having a packaging system for 150 KB would buy you a whole bunch of additional biology if you care about natural gene regulation. Yes, that makes sense. And I guess if if the yeast, if the SC 2.0 project suggests that introns don't matter, it will ah. it will probably be on a, it, there will still be big fitness effects, right? So they'll, they'll matter in some way. What do you think? Let's just talk about yeast and introns for a second. Yes. It's a very different ball game than certainly human or mammalian. Okay, cells. good, good. 5% of yeast genes have introns and those introns are very, very short, like a couple right. hundred base pairs. It's a very, very compact genome. I, I think it's apples to oranges in talking about introns in mammalian cells. If anyone is really interested in learning more about this, I think the, the person to talk to is actually called Yaz Aizawa, and he's in Japan. And he's published some really nice work around the role of introns, at least in a subset of genes, and, and how that impacts the function of expression, et cetera. And, and leveraging, you know, he's a, he's a product of the Buka Lab as well, participated in the SC2 project. And is, it has also sort of gone from yeast to thinking about applying app, the, the genome writing style technologies in mammalian cells. And so he's doing some really beautiful work thinking about the role of introns. 
Amazing. Yeah. So, so human introns almost certainly matter a lot. And I guess there's, you know, in for treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there's kind of mini gene deliveries where they chop out pieces of the introns, right? But there's, it's, it's likely that for other haploinsufficient genes or other issues that delivering a whole gene with its introns intact would work a lot better. That makes a lot of sense. Just like tissue specific expression using using the yep. 50 KB upstream of even just the the coding sequence, you know, that might buy you a lot. It's going to be a, it's a gene by gene case basis, but I think that there's this is this whole world of untapped opportunity with respect to mammalian genome engineering. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, so that's Neo Vector on the other side of the equation. You'll have to remind me of the name, but it's about creating neo, ye- neo, neo yeast new proteins, neo yeast. Yeah. yeah. So this one is a genome rewritten yeast designed for incorporating non-canonical amino acids or non-standard amino acids into proteins. In this case, you need to eliminate one or more codons globally, and then you can reserve them and repurpose one, let's just say one codon for use in read through or in programming a non-canonical. So this is a big project. This is not just genome rewriting. It's also protein and RNA engineering. So once you get your rewritten genome, you're still in the position to need to engineer orthogonal translation, which is a synthetase and a tRNA that work together with a non-canonical at the exclusion of all canonical amino acids. Vice versa, your non-canonical cannot work with any of the sort of canonical translation systems. It's a big project and, and really interesting. I think the two big applications we're really interested in, leveraging non-canonicals that enable click chemistry, so you can just attach a secondary moiety very efficiently, lots of applications there. And then protein therapeutics and the use of non-canonicals in particular with respect to GLP-1, which is the the molecules uh, associated with with some of the diabetes and and obesity indications. We're also interested in that that avenue. Yeah, say a little bit more about that. So would you use the yeast as a bioreactor to produce GLP-1? Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit more. About that. This is a journey we're going on currently, contemplating the directing the Neo Yeast program towards GLP ones. The requirement here is incorporating a non canonical called AIB, whether this is for Ozempic or Terzepatide or others. AIB needs to be incorporated. You can't do that cellularly right now. You need a high efficiency, scalable platform that's engineered to work with AIB. And so so that's the sort of, I guess, the problem statement, you know, us, probably others are going after. So how are they produced today in a, in a chemistry, like an organic chemistry process or something? And this is all news to me. So there's a non-canonical amino acid that's part of these GLP-1s. That's correct. These are produced, uh, at least in part, chemically. I know there have been scalability issues. I mean, there's been enormous demand and, and supply issues. Is that part of it that there's not yet a scalable way to generate these? The demand is enormous. I mean, I think yeah. the expectation is that this sort of class of drugs is going to be the most in demand, highest Ever. revenue grossing drug in human history. And so the amount of API required is just going to be enormous. So I, yeah. I can't speak to you know, what the expectations were by the inventors and the, the major developers of these drugs, but it's probably far exceeding it. And even their wildest dreams, one would, one would contemplate. And so to that end, identifying scalable solutions is critical. Yeah, absolutely. Why, you may not know this, I certainly have no idea. Why is there a non-canonical amino acid in, in these drugs? I do know. It, it extends half-life in the body. Oh, interesting. Do you know which one it is that, so there's one that breaks down quite quickly and they swap it out and it lasts a lot longer. Is that kind of the That's the right. And, and it makes them protease resistant. Fascinating. This is, this is why I do this pod- podcast. I get to learn so much from people like yeah. you. Well, to be clear, my expertise <laughs> are in the enabling technology for manufacturing and not in the biology of, of the drugs themselves. In terms of how the the construction of entire chromosomes actually yeah. happens, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Are they printed? Are they yeah. assembled chemically? How does it work? Yeah, we design them in silico. Typically, if this is rewrite of a known existing wild type chromosome, we would start with that wild type sequence and and use proprietary is a strong word. Use software, let's say, generically speaking, use software to introduce all of the edits, whether it's an assertion or a deletion. Or a, a sort of a recoding, if you will. That's the third category. 
take that sequence, carve it up into pieces. And, and there's two things to optimize for. The first thing is downstream assemblability. And that depends on how you plan to assemble the, 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 the longer molecule. And the second one, and, and this is the sad part, and the, what I consider to be the dirty little secret of synthetic biology, the synthesizability of that molecule or that, that stretch of DNA. Not all pieces of DNA should be considered equal when shipping them out to a, a synthesis company for synthesis. So that said, we optimize for those two things. The, the more difficult to synthesize parts uh, will break down into increasingly smaller pieces of DNA all the way down to oligos. We then source all of that DNA uh, once it arrives in-house and it's sort of checked in, we'll, we'll start the assembly process. And, and the reality is that is how chromosomes are built today. And the speed then depends on how efficient we are at each step of construction, which is putting the pieces of DNA together and, and sequence verifying and make sure we've got what we want and then how many steps we need to carry out to get to the end product that's going into cells. And so the, the simple optimizations there really rely on, well, well, how do we assemble more pieces in one shot? And, and that's what we've we've put time into and we're really good at it, Neil. So do you need to, des are there kind of linkers on on the ends of the oligos? How do they, how, how does the clicking together of all these tiny pieces actually actually happen? Depends on your assembly strategy. This is one of my favorite topics. There's lots of different ways you can assemble DNA. The, the original approach, I guess, would have been just standard type two restriction enzymes, newer technologies in the last 10 years. Golden Gate, Gibson would be the two the two favorites. This is not giving anything away because it's published extensively in the literature. Using yeast to assemble DNA is, is a very, very reasonable approach, and we rely heavily on that. Sort of by yeast and for yeast is, is one way to think about it. Yeast is great at assembling its own DNA, and then and then you can take that same DNA and and sort of replace the the wild type chromosomes. And so we do a lot of that. And what are the big barriers to scale right now, both in terms of throughput? And I know it sounds like you're a process person, so I want—I really want to understand how we scale this process, yeah. both in terms of throughput, as in going to many, many more 150 KB deliveries that live in, and breathe in the cells they go in, and then also in terms of the length. How can we go from 150 to a megabase to when, when, when will we be able to sequence a whole human chromosome length fragments? And, and maybe it's an assembly yeah. problem at some point, but I'd love to hear about the scaling vectors. Yeah, you've, you've summarized it very well, everything you just said. How do you print longer pieces of starting material? So you know, the, the steps are you start with nucleotides, uh, you make oligos, you make double-stranded DNA, and then you make bigger double-stranded DNA. And how do you how do you go from making oligos to making really long double-stranded DNA just by printing it out? That is a journey a lot of people are going on. We're not actually trying to solve that. We ultimately want to be able to design a very long piece of DNA, order it, and have it arrive the next day. And so there's a lot, a lot that underpins that. And, and we're not necessarily in the game of going from nucleotide we're not in the game of going from nucleotides to chromosomes and we have intermediate technologies that allow us to do that but our big goal is to be able to access those dnas as fast as possible by by whatever means possible to put them into cells because what we really want to do is that cell engineering and those applications like that's where we want to live that whole journey of of getting assembling DNA is, is, is one that a lot of people are on right now, and we're happy to participate, and we talk to everybody about that. How do you get it into cells? It depends what cell you're looking at. And there's a lot of people thinking about delivery technologies. NEO is sort of in this position of, we need to have technologies that are useful in the near term. Yeah. And we're not you know, optimizing for 20 years from now. So 150 KB is a, is a very big improvement. It is not the end state that's going to allow this big future of all genomes are designed uh, for biotech purposes, to be very clear. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What are the sort of near-term, low-hanging fruit applications we can go after with an eye towards the future? This is going to be a stepwise process. There might be a step full change at some point, and we'll be part of that game, but we will not be the only piece to it. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what are the biggest barriers to, if we took the gene therapy 
yeah. application? Is it is it delivery? Is it something else? What stops us from there's 7,000 rare diseases, at least 1,000 of them are probably haploinsufficient genes where if you could figure out how to get the, the full length gene into someone, it might, might have a positive impact. What, what gets us in the way of applying this technology, you think, over the next decade to many, many thousands of diseases? Deep understanding of the biology of the disease and what is actually going to correct it. I don't even know that the neotechnology is the answer. I think I think it's about about a deep understanding of the biology of the disease and having really predictive models, either cells or animals, that that impart or actually report out on what will ultimately be the the therapeutic. Right. So if they know what to write to solve the problem, then if you can write, if you know what to write, you can yeah. probably write it and then yeah. figure out how to deliver it. But it's the knowing what to write in the first place that is the challenge. Is that right? I, I think that's a really big piece of it in the next five to 10 years. I think that the, the 10 to 20 years would be crazy to say longer than that. If the solution requires megabases of DNA and it needs to be delivered systematically or systemically, excuse me, we need new delivery technologies. And I think I think it's the piece of how do we know what it is we're trying to solve for, and then how do we get it into the body? And the longer the piece of DNA that is required to solve, the the harder the challenge is. I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any big big differences between mammalian and yeast, or are a lot of the lessons learned in yeast porting over somewhat nicely hmm. to the mammalian genome? Great question. Well, I mean, the big difference is definitely delivery. Mm -hmm. why, um, why is that why is delivery so different a couple of reasons yeast is is really good at homologous recombination it's really easy to replace segments of dna so if you want to integrate into the existing genome very easy yeast also has very short centromeres 125 bases and we understand what all the features are that program a chromosome in yeast and they're very easy to engineer so we can build these we like to call them neochromosome shockingly <laughs> Uh, we can build these things incredibly easily as circles or as linear molecules and have sort of these supernumerary chromosomes programmed and operating alongside the 16 wild type chromosomes incredibly easily. All of that is harder in mammalian cells. Innate responses are activated, which makes it harder to put DNA into, into the nucleus. Mammalian cells aren't as good at homologous recombination, so it's harder to have it integrate. Obviously, double strand break technology has made that more efficient. Finally, chromosome. Features in mammalian cells are, are a lot more complicated. Both telomeres and centromeres are far longer and more complicated than in yeast. And so it's really hard to design what we would call a neochromosome that is highly stable and functional and easy to work with, like USB style, like plug and play, way, way harder in, in mammalian cells. Yeah, that makes sense. Last question here, just because we're running out of time. I'm wondering what application is it that you are really excited about, really believe in, um, but you just haven't run into that partner who says, yes, I, I see it the same way. And it sounds like gene therapy, there's a big, there's a big world out there of people who will believe in that the, uh, you know, the, the de development of, or incorporation of non canonical amino acids, I'll see that is there is there a third bucket where you'd say, I actually really think people should be thinking about x, uh, but I haven't run into somebody who is and I'm hoping maybe Ooh. they're listening and we'll reach out to you. Oh, that's so exciting. That's a, that's a hard one to answer. The answer, I should have a better answer than this, I think. What I will say, in the interest of, of having an answer for you, through conversations in this ecosystem building strat, part of our strategy, we are identifying increasingly more application areas. This is hard to answer because there's confidentiality that, yep. that I kind of need to consider. We, I think we're starting to see success in our strategy, which is to say in this ecosystem building approach where we're taking on these bite-sized projects and having these deeper discovery conversations, we are beginning to identify these larger scale opportunities and leveling up in these partnerships that we were sort of burgeoning partnerships that gives me great optimism that this future that I would so like to believe will exist of genome scale engineered cells for biotech, our hypothesis is, is more right than wrong right now. Amazing. 
Yeah, it seems like you have, like you were saying earlier, it's a new category and it's that's both a blessing and a curse because you have so much you can do. You're starting with such a broad playing field. You know, I think the example that people will probably be familiar with are many of the genome sequencing companies like Illumina and PacBio and Oxford Nanopore and all of those that started and had a million and one directions they could go, right? There's so, there's so many things you could do with this. So part of the challenge now is to your point earlier, figuring out what what are the things that you can make a difference on in the next couple mm-hmm. of years and yep. ladder up to that that future, which is, I agree, extremely exciting. Great. Thank you so um, much. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks everyone for listening. As always, if you have a guest recommendation, any feedback, you can reach us at any time. And like I always say with every single episode, the thing that we'd appreciate most that you do if you like this episode is share it either one-to-one with a friend or a colleague or uh, put it on social media if you're feeling very brave. That way other people can find us and hear Leslie and her team's amazing work. So thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. 